First off, happy Earth Day. Thank you everyone for joining us today for the virtual cooking session. Uh, we know these are difficult times right now and we're all adjusting together and adapting to uh, the new normal of remote working and remote cooking. Uh, I'm Paul Pettis, the Director of Communications for Centerplate. And right now our company Centerplate would normally be hosting baseball fans in Seattle at T-Mobile Park. Uh, right now baseball is one of the many activities that we'd, enjoy, that we'd be enjoying as a country. And what we'd like to do today is bring a bit of the ballpark experience to your kitchens as we're working together and cooking together. On top of that, one of the many industries hurting right now is the U.S. fishing industry. Local fishermen from Seattle to the Gulf are struggling to sell to their usual clients. Restaurants, hotels, stadiums, you name it. And so, in honor of Earth Day, we've partnered with the Ocean Conservancy, a group that knows this well, and are joining us today to help shine a bit of light on what's happening in that industry, as well as talk about some of the ways that you can support these communities by cooking sustainable seafood at home while you're quarantined with your friends, your families, and hopefully you're staying socially distant at the same time. Chef Taylor Park normally is overseeing a staff of about 200 people and prepping to feed nearly 50,000 fans at T-Mobile Park. Today though, he's going to walk us through a couple of his favorite seafood dishes in his home kitchen so you can make them too. Joining him, Becca robbins just Claire, who is Senior Director of Arctic Programs at the Ocean Conservancy. She's based in Bellingham, Washington. Becca is joined by George Leonard, the Ocean Conservancy's Chief Scientist based in Santa Cruz, California. Thank you, Chef, Becca, and George for joining us today. We'll go ahead now and let Chef kick us off. And a quick note on Zoom and questions. Please use the chat box to send us any questions throughout the demo and we'll have a dedicated Q&A at the end. So with that, I turn it over to Chef Taylor Park, who will walk us through today's virtual cooking session. Excellent. Thank you, Paul. Uh, appreciate the awesome introduction there. Um, I want to start off by thanking Ocean Conservancy, uh, George, Becca, thank you for joining us. Uh, Michael, thank you for getting all this set up. I know uh, Zoom's kind of new to everybody, so going through all the steps to get all of us together and to promote this awesome cause. Happy Earth Day, everybody. Uh, at the same time, uh, things we want to talk about. Uh, well, I guess first off, I should say thank you for joining us. And I hope everybody's feeling well. I hope everybody's doing well. All your family and friends are doing well. Uh, these are those interesting times we've all been talking about. Um, at the same time, uh, I want to welcome you into my kitchen. Uh, I usually don't you know, and honestly, say I usually don't dress like this in my kitchen. <laughs> but uh, for this, we wanted to show off what Center Plate can do working with Ocean Conservancy. Uh, we want to talk about sustainability. What is sustainability? So you know where what it is, where you can find sustainable fish, um, and kind of go from there. Every chef in the world will always tell you that quality is number one. Uh, so you always want to find a local high quality fish to use. And part of this is to kind of help you navigate uh, what you can do in order to find that. You can write questions to ask uh, your local butcher or fishmonger uh, and just make sure that you guys, uh, the customer, get the best local product you can uh, or best sustainable product you possibly can uh, that also helps promote the local fisheries. So uh, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Becca. And uh, yeah, um, you're up in Bellingham. So how's it going up there? Thank you, Chef, um, and it's a, a pleasure to be here today. I'll echo your happy Earth Day greetings to everyone, um, and uh, thank you for joining us here. I'm really excited. These are two of my favorite things, eating seafood and talking about fish, although I realize I probably should have eaten lunch before we gotten started. I'm going to hear a funny noise. That's just my stomach growling as you cook these delicious delicacies up. Um, so I'm Becca Robbins, just Claire. I'm a Senior Director of Arctic Programs at o Ocean Conservancy. Um, and our work at the Arctic program, um, we're putting critical protections in place in a region that's on the front lines of climate change. Um, and at Ocean Conservancy, I also work closely with my colleagues on fish sustainability along the entire west coast of the U.S. and throughout the nation. So um, talking about sustainable fish and fisheries is, is definitely something I'm really happy to be uh, talking about today. I used to live in Alaska, um, and a lot of my career has been focused on working with tribes and communities and fishermen to support sustainable and resilient fisheries. Um, now I live in Bellingham and I'm really lucky to get to spend my time here when I'm not at work on the water, 
um, crabbing and catching fish myself. Um, and a lot of my friends here um, and from Alaska are fishermen or otherwise connected to fisheries. Um, so really feeling the impact uh, of the coronavirus and the um, impacts right now. Um, running a small business, as you can imagine, is always tough. Um, but the impacts of coronavirus on fishermen are, are really dramatic. Um, so I'm excited to be here today to share uh, in some delicious seafood and to talk about how you can connect with some of our local fishermen um, to, to support them and, uh, and find some delicious source, sources of fresh fish. Um, I'm also a Mariners fan, I don't get to be in the stadium, but I got my hat out anyways. Um, and I'm glad to be able to combine uh, fish and baseball today. It sounds like a good, good day. So um, excited to get started on some cooking and, and talk about where you can find sustainable seafood and support some of the fishermen that we've already talked about a little bit. Uh, we'll be sure, sure to share some links um, so you can find them afterwards. So before that, I want to turn it over to George Leonard um, to say hello. Thank you, Becca. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here, Shep and Paul. Um, I uh, am Chief Scientist for Ocean Conservancy. I'm down here in, in Santa Cruz, so I'm a Giants fan. I'm just going to put that out there. I grew up in Boston, though, so I just started off as a Red Sox fan, eating uh, uh, eating food uh, under the, the Green Monster there in Boston. Um, it, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here. Ocean Conservancy is uh, almost 50 years old, like uh, like uh, Earth Day today, uh, and we're headquartered in D.C. We work entirely on ocean conservation, and it's primarily because we keep the health, the ocean healthy. We really keep all of us healthy, and that's especially true in terms of the seafood that the uh, that the ocean provides. Uh, provides to us. I, I work with Becca and a whole range of uh, folks across the institution, including both in Washington, D.C., uh, but in many parts of the country as well. We have regional staff in, in all the regions of the country, the, uh, uh, Alaska, the Pacific Northwest, down here in California, throughout the Gulf of Mexico, and up into New England as well. Uh, and our real goal is to bring science and science-based decision-making uh, into ocean policy and ocean conservation. And that's very much true around fish as well. Um, if we use science to make informed decision making, we can make sure um, that uh, we can essentially have our fish and eat them too, uh, which is what we're going to be doing here today. And um, uh, the ocean is an amazing generator uh, of protein, and it's a vital, a life-giving source um, to all of us, whether you live uh, on the coast like many of us do or, or in the middle of the country um, as well. Um, before we get started, I just want to I do want to thank Paul for the invitation from Center Plate. We worked closely with Center Plate during the uh, 54th uh, Super Bowl down in Miami, uh, right before the coronavirus really took off, um, to bring oceans to a whole new audience that is sport fans. Uh, and something like 60% of Americans uh, declare themselves uh, to be sports fans. So there's a whole lot of people out there that we think we can reach to bring um, the real importance to oceans uh, to a whole new audience. The ocean is a vital is vital to all of our survival and we think we need more people especially on a day like oceans uh like um like earth day today uh, to recognize and, and join us in the, uh, the goal of keeping the ocean healthy and and thinking about it and eating uh, is a certainly a good way to do that so uh, my stomach is also grumbling so i'm looking forward to the next steps uh here chef awesome well thank you george uh, appreciate the uh all the information it's awesome um so to stick with baseball, the, the fun analogy, this is our leadoff hitter. Uh, what we're going to start off with is cod. Uh, so Becca, can you tell us a little bit about cod, uh, where to get it from? Uh, we were talking earlier, you mentioned Bering Sea, um, Alaska. Uh, tell us more about the fish, please. Yeah, definitely. Um, cod is a, a great fish for fish and chips. Um, it's, a, it's a great staple for a lot of things because you can adapt it to all sorts of meals and flavor. It's one I definitely always make sure I have in my freezer. Um, when you're shopping for a Pacific cod, um, you wanna look for a few things, a long line jig or a pot caught, Alaska Pacific cod um, is, your, is your best choice um, from the Bering Sea. Uh, the Gulf of Alaska cod fishery is also a good one, um, but right now it's closed down because climate change has really had some impacts on that stock. Um, yeah, and, and so cod's a good one. There are also some other, uh, you know, you can always use halibut as well. That's a great 
that's a great substitute for Pacific cod. Um, it's also a good choice from a sustainability point of view. That's something that's caught right here in Washington. Um, so you can get local halibut as well as uh, Alaska halibut's also a good choice and halibut prices are slightly lower than normal right now. Um, and that, that's also a good, good fish for fish and chips. Yeah, so Jeff, just on that, you're, you're going to be cooking cod today, which I'm looking forward to. But how versatile is this recipe to different kinds of seafood? Um, as Becca indicated, um, the U.S. fishermen are really struggling right now. Like many folks, um, income is down upwards of 90 place, uh, 90 percent. Um, the supply chains have been cut off. So anything we can do to support them by uh, by supporting the fish that they have available on the dock would be great. And I wonder to what extent what you're going to do today. Um, is a great is a great recipe for for Pacific cod, but maybe for other uh, species that people can find in the local markets too. Definitely, definitely. Um, so the, yeah, cod is a great. Honestly, I love cod. I feel like it's a very underutilized fish. Uh, I know a lot of people grew up on it. A lot of people don't like it, but it's so versatile. It it's hard to overcook it. It has such great healthy oils in it. No matter what you, I won't say no matter what you do with, but it's very hard. Like I said, to overcook. So when you're deep frying it like we're about to do and you have a light beer batter, uh, it keeps everything in there. It keeps it really nice and moist and delicious. Uh, even if you're just baking it and you want to go without any type of breadcrumbs if you're celiac or anything like that, it's a great fish to sprinkle a little bit of salt and pepper on it, roast it, grill it. Uh, you can do anything with it, to be honest. Uh, and it holds up really well. It doesn't fall apart. Um, and it's very forgivable, which is fantastic, especially if you're a, a new cook or a non uh, advanced cook, uh, cooking from home, you don't have to necessarily worry too much about destroying it. Um, so with that kind of going off, or I should say going off of that, uh, with this recipe, halibut is a great, great, uh, addition or, uh, substitute. If you have halibut, uh, salmon works out great. Um, any type of white fish, to be honest, works out great. Depending on if you're East coast, West coast, um, and then, yeah, it's, I'm trying to think of what else I've used. Dover sole, I've used cod, halibut, salmon. Uh, I usually would stick with sockeye salmon, king salmon, maybe a little bit higher end. But if you want to go very gourmet, you can definitely use king salmon. Uh, we definitely ask that you keep it sustainable, a local, and maybe Becca, not to uh, throw you in the real fast, if you know any good uh, local king salmon fisheries or sockeye or anything like that, uh, what should they look for? Should they also look for uh, whole cod, troll cod? I know there's a ton of different fish and how they're catching them out there. Um, could you get us a little bit more on that one? I know I'm just kind of throwing you under there. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, definitely. Uh, salmon is is something near and dear to my heart, uh, and one of my favorite fishes to eat personally. We have a, a ongoing feud in my house. I prefer king salmon. My husband will take a sockeye any any day of the week. So we try to have some of each in the in the fridge and freezer. Um, in general, for salmon, I think the most important thing is getting wild caught salmon. Um, and US caught wild salmon is, is gonna be a good ch choice um, pretty much across the board. You wanna avoid farmed salmon. Um, and there's uh, some some great fish on the market. Um, you know, the, the seasons are just getting ready to start, um, but one of the things that uh, my fishermen friend of, friends have taught me is that, you know, frozen seafood sometimes is almost even fresher than, than fresh and can be a really good sustainable choice. Um, so we always buy, buy uh, sockeye salmon um, from Bristol Bay usually. That's where a lot of fishermen um, in Bellingham and down in Seattle, uh, a lot of Alaska folks fish there and, and uh, fish there and fish in the Southeast Alaska. Um, of course, we have some local salmon fisheries too. I think those are going to be a little bit um, uh, lower than usual this year. Um, there's lots of good choices for salmon in the Pacific Northwest. Um, so yeah, uh, you can go again, like we we're saying, off of any of those fish, um, and they're all they're all great. Uh, it's frying it up, and I'm about to walk you through the recipe here um, again. Great thing, fish, sustainable, it's healthy. It's it, honestly, it's very easy to make. Um, and just try not to be intimidated by it. So uh, a lot of our players uh, in the baseball club, I know they like to eat fish, it's healthy. There's more of a push for health conscious foods out there. 
Uh, we definitely it was center plate at the ballpark and working with the Mariners. Uh, the Mariners are very forward thinking with healthy eating. Uh, they exude that in everything they do. Um, so when we make anything at the ballpark, we always try and have a decent, healthy option uh, throughout the ballpark anywhere you can get. So fish is definitely a portion of that. Um, again, you get all the, fat, the great fats from cod, salmon. Uh, we also have a salmon sandwich. We have a Dungeness crab sandwich. Uh, again, we work with Ocean uh, Conservancy as well on those. So we're making sure we're getting a sustainable uh, product in. But uh, yeah, if you guys are good, I can walk through the prep of this right now and just kind of show you exactly how the fish and chips and the uh, shrimp basket are made. Big enough, yeah, chef. go for it, chef. And just as, as you follow, as as you start to cook up and, and whip that all together, just everyone who's listening on, we will share these recipes uh, and the instructions if you want to try this yourself at home. So obviously everyone's taking copious notes while chef is cooking, but uh, after we finish up, we will send around uh, the uh, cheat sheet if you do want to cook these up yourself and we'll have a nice image and set instructions for everyone for once we finish up today. So with that, uh, feel free to go for it, Chef. Excellent. And before I even start that, uh, what I want to touch on is safety. So again, you're deep frying. Uh, and you're doing it in your home. I have probably about a, close to a gallon of oil right here. And it's at 350, 375 degrees. So you want to make sure you're incredibly safe. So uh, again, I want to make sure I'm not burning down my house. And I'm sure you do too. I have a fire extinguisher ready. I have a damp towel that if this for some horrible reason caught fire, I could toss it on top of it to smother the fire. Uh, when I'm dropping the, the, any of the fish or the shrimp in, what I'll do is I'll make sure that the fire is off so nothing splatters and can ignite that way as well. Uh, make sure you are dressed properly. Frying in shorts and sandals and maybe no shirt. I don't know how you would fry. Uh, I highly recommend wearing something that's covering. So make sure I have jeans on, I have shirt, uh, shoes on, I have a apron that's covering me so I don't get burned. On top of that too, uh, we want to touch base hand washing, especially with COVID-19 uh, going on right now. Make sure you wash your hands before you touch food, before you serve food, 20 seconds, water as hot as you can possibly get it. Uh, ideally in the restaurant industry, we always say you want your water to be about 110 degrees. No one's going to measure that, but it's pretty much as hot as you possibly can wash your hands, 20 minutes, nice lather. Uh, turn your knob off uh, with a paper towel, then you can dry your hands, uh, get rid of that. Then I put um, one time use gloves, and I, I should be washing my hands every time I change my gloves as well. Um, hey, also, Jeff, can I interrupt you for a sec? We're having a little, little technical difficulty with the cell phone. It appears to be lagging. So when you want to show folks what you're doing, can you try to just tilt your computer image down, which is working well? Um, not necessarily part of our original plan, but we'll make it work on the fly here. Excellent. I was going to say, as soon as I go through the health and safety tips, I was going to actually, uh, bear with me here. This is kind of new to all of us. I'm going to take my cell phone and then I will kind of point it down and show you and go through all the tips of uh, what the product looks like right now, what it looks like at the end and everything like that. So uh, good. starting with that defrosting. So again, like uh, Becca was mentioning, sometimes frozen fish can be better than fresh fish. So we got our cod. It was frozen. Uh, it's from the Bering Sea. So I let it defrost in my fridge overnight. So it wasn't just left on the counter or left under running water. Uh, it's a, the safest way possible. It's in a controlled uh, below 40 degree environment. Um, so we let that defrost. And before we got started, I did roll in a little bit of flour at first. This, is, this will allow the beer batter to actually adhere to the outside of the fish, uh, which will help with the crust once I start deep frying it. Same with the shrimp, let it defrost. Uh, these are 1620 golf shrimp. Um, so I want to say, Beck was mentioning that the shrimp season around here will hopefully start up in the next month or two. Uh, so we should be able to get fresh local shrimp. Um, but if you're using halibut, uh, if you're in the Pacific Northwest, we have Nia Bay and we have a couple others. I think Becca or George would probably expand on where you can get local fish from a little bit later on here. But um, yeah, I'm about to grab the phone and then we can start going through the prep and everything else. So hopefully I don't give you guys vertigo as I go through all this. All right, so this is the cod. Uh, again, like I said, it's been rolled in a little bit of flour. So this is the final product. It's the cod fish and chips. There are, the chips are uh, organic French fries underneath. We have some lemon slices for uh, just a little bit of a garnish. I have house-made 
uh, tartar sauce. And then we have flour, we have a little bit of dill. So that's not in the recipe that we'll put online, but just for the sake of color differential here and non-monochromatic colors. Um, I, I added that to the batter just to kind of give a, a little bit of a different color. Uh, you have a little bit of salt, baking soda, and cornstarch. So mix that, mix that all together with some local beer. I have some Mac and Jacks here uh, for anybody in the Pacific Northwest. And then we'll just start to batter the fish. A hey, question on the beer there, Chef. Does it matter whether it's an IPA or a stout or Corona? Um, you want an ale. Yeah, it can be, it can easily be uh, an IPA. Um, so one second here. So if you see me dropping the fish, I'm not just letting it plump down. I'm kind of waving it around real fast. And then I'm going to let it kind of fall away from me. So that way I don't splash any type of hot oil on myself, on my counter, or anything else that prevents. Uh, any type of potential fire or burns. Uh, but getting back to your question, the beer itself, it can be, you want an ale, you don't want a stout or a porter. Um, I mean, if you're doing something with red meat, you may want to be able to do that, but with fish, uh, I, that would create this really funky brown color, and I don't think it would necessarily be too appetizing. Uh, and then also the caramely notes that are found or the coffee notes may make a little too bitter for the um, the batter itself or the flavor. So each of these pieces is cut to about four to five ounces. And then we'll let that cook for about 10 minutes. I'm going to cook that fish until an internal temperature is red for about our inter internal temperature of 145 degrees. Uh, and same with the shrimp. And it looks like, yeah, uh, Paul just put the, the fish and chip recipe up. I'm going to change my gloves and wash my hands real fast because I just got battered all over my hands. So bear with me real fast. Uh, so when you're working with fish in general, I let my fish get out to room temperature. And then, so it usually takes about 30, 40 minutes to get at room temperature. You don't want to be fro throwing frozen product into the deep fryer, the ice that's on it. You could easily start making the fryer pop and then create burns and anything else like that, spillage. Uh, you'll hear it keep going right there. Um, but as we're also saying, you can easily use sockeye salmon, halibut, sole, um, this is the other fun one. After you wash your hands and try to put gloves back on, it'll be a little bit of a challenge. Jeff, so, you, you're, you probably wear gloves at work, I imagine, but you're wearing them in the home kitchen too? Is that just for extra precaution? Um, when it comes to something like this, I will. Actually, uh, I have gloves around the house in general for any type of chemical cleaning and whatever else. So I'll use it when something is better like this. It's a little bit easier of a cleanup instead of having to wash your hands every single time uh, or continuously go back and forth and just get caked on flour all over your hands. It creates this giant mess. Um, so either way, wear gloves, wash your hands after you do it. Uh, it makes it a lot easier on yourself. Um, but with that also being said, I want to say we wanted to talk about um, – Game day and stuff like that. So my typical day, uh, kind of going through while this is cooking, I can talk with you about what a typical day the chef looks like at a ballpark. Um, so yeah, it's making sure a lot of it is making sure the product gets in, making sure that the people get in to cook the product. Uh, I'm going to say I usually walk by between 5 and 13 miles a day when, on any given game day. Uh, I would say right now we should also – Correct me if I'm wrong, I would say we would be playing, if we didn't have uh, the shelter at home, we should be playing Minnesota today, so I would have been at the ballpark. I believe we'd be prepping up for the Angels, which would have been tomorrow. So, unfortunately, uh, we're not doing that right now, but I'm glad to have you in my kitchen and uh, getting to do this. So, it's a little bit of a change for us. 
Uh, we're definitely getting through it. And uh, I mean, we'll go fun while doing it too. So, Chef, we have a question that came in from one of the attendees. Um, yeah. For and, and the question is, if, if I'm afraid to cook seafood in the kitchen, if I'm afraid to stink up my apartment building and overcome that fear of cooking food at home, what are some tips to, to get more comfortable with, with cooking seafood in my home kitchen? Um, I would definitely say, and let me know if you can't hear me because the fryer is picking up from my end. Um, frying will definitely make your apartment smell a lot worse than, say, baking or searing or something like that. Make sure your food system is turned on. Uh, the, le the least amount of oil, the better. Um, if you're worried about, again, smell for the most part, uh, hand searing, baking, uh, using lemon fresh herbs will help cover that up. And it creates more of a perfume smell, if you would. Um, but yeah, even with me under the hood system here, it's my house is going to smell like a fryer. <laughs> so it, it, it's kind of a, the nature of the beast, unfortunately, but you do produce some very good food with it. Um, I don't know too many people who don't like, but don't like fried fish. Um, so yeah, we can, I'll grab my phone and we can go through what this is looking like right now. And chef, one more question as, as you're doing that, are there any tips for avoiding that kind of burning eye feeling that comes with frying during home cooking? Uh, burning eye feeling you said? Yes. Um, I can't think of any off the top of my head. I think you just kind of get used to it after a while, to be honest. Um, it's standing back, kind of taking a deep breath. Again, also having a, a decent hood system helps out things in the beginning too. So work with what you have. Um, if you know your hood system is not too ideal, again, I've been in uh, some of the houses we've lived in. Um, the hood system was not good and I would set off the alarms continuously. So whether I was cooking bacon, whether I was searing chicken, it was bad. So kind of try and work with what you have. Um, it might help too to find a 50,000 seat open air ballpark to, to ventilate <laughs> and to have some fresh air under as well. So if, exactly. if any listeners out there have one of those, yeah. I'm going to put this phone down. I'm going to check the temperature, the internal temperature of the fish right now. So you check the temperature just like you would with me. Yeah, I'm hitting 150 degrees. Okay. Uh, I'm hitting 150 degrees. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to let this fish rest. Uh, if you serve it right now, 150 degrees. Some people do love it that way. Uh, I like to serve mine warm, a little bit hot, nothing that's going to completely scald your mouth. Allows the fats and the juices to all kind of come back together, congeal a little bit, uh, and kind of mellow out. Uh, this allows, so when you bite into it, all the liquid doesn't come out, creates soggy fries or anything like that. So we'll let this rest for probably about five minutes. It'll also take the temperature up for an additional five degrees too. So say if you're cooking chicken, you can do the same uh, or any other type of fish. Uh, generally, let it rest for about five minutes, pull it out, try to aim for that five degrees under where you want it to be and then by the time you go to it uh it'll that carryover cooking is what it's called and then you'll have a much much better product you'll have more moisture in the product it's rested it's just, it's just better overall um so my fish and chips are my fish are resting right now i was going to move on to the shrimp so here is the shrimp basket this is the final uh, product there. So this is made with, again, flour, granulated garlic, a little smoked paprika, cornstarch. Uh, I just put all the shrimp into that flour. So I didn't let them soak in anything. They've been sitting in here room temp for probably about 30, 40 minutes now. Um, so you can see that it has a nice little crust on it. All the flour doesn't fall off of it when I'm picking it up. So what I'll just do is I'll do these in small batches, shake off any excess flour, and dump that shrimp in away from yourself. Sorry, let me get the camera actually on the shrimp. Okay. 
And there you go. So those shrimp cook incredibly quick. So I want to say it's going to be less than a minute uh, or maybe a little bit more, probably around the two minute mark thinking about it now that I say that out loud. Um, so we got those going right now and they should be ready uh, pretty quickly here. And we've got the recipe for that shrimp basket up now for everyone to see. And we will send that around as well after we finish up. Perfect. Uh, and Chef, you, meant, you mentioned earlier shrimp are another one where we've got some great local options here in Washington. I think uh, the shrimp season usually opens up in May and we'll see things are all a little bit different right now, but uh, hopefully it will open up because I know that's one of my favorites. Um, but there's also, you know, it's great to support local seafood. I think supporting uh, all of our U.S. seafood producers right now is really important. Um, our, a lot of our fisheries, uh, our seafood goes to restaurants um, and it goes and a lot of it actually gets exported. And right now those are two markets that aren't working. Um, and so Gulf uh, shrimp is also a really good choice from um in the U.S. and that's something you can find year-round at, at most supermarkets as well. Uh, do we know what the uh, the salmon ones are looking like this year? As far as our fishermen able to actually go out and fish, um, are those going to get pushed back? Do we know anything about that quite yet, or is it still too too early to tell? That's a, a good question, um, and I think a question a lot of us are waiting on the edge of our seats to find out. Um, for now, I think the recreational fisheries uh, in Washington State are, are closed for now, um, and as far as commercial fisheries go, I think it, it really depends um, what you're looking at. The, some of those runs I mentioned are definitely on the low side this year, um, and, and what opens up is going to, I think, depend on a variety of factors in the, the markets. Um, and, and fishermen being able to safely fish. Of course, all of our seafood producers are really careful and um, you know, jumping through a lot of, lot of hoops to make sure that everything is safe. I think, uh, and I know in uh, the Alaska fisheries, they're, they're flying people up and actually, and, or flying them to Seattle and quarantining them for 14 days um, before they go on a boat or before they start working in a processing facility. So there's a lot of innovation happening um, to try to, to be able to catch, continue fisheries, but I think a, a lot of it's still up in the air and we'll just have to wait and see. But the, for better or worse, there's definitely a lot of fish on the market now. So there's, um, there's plenty of, of fish out there for us to buy. Uh, and the more you can buy it directly from the fishermen, that's always a great choice. Um, we'll, be able, we'll be sure to share some links um, on our website for how you can do that. Excellent. Excellent. Um, let me grab the phone here real fast, and then I will show you what the finished product here looks like. Again, the shrimp is resting, the cod is resting, and we serve it with uh, some French fries, lime, and then we have a spicy aioli right here. So if we want to, uh, since we have a little bit, it's went a little bit faster than we initially anticipated. Uh, so these sauces are very easy to make. The whole point of these sauces, other than outside of being a condiment, uh, it needs to be able to be made in the stand, away from a big kitchen, away from a big production commissary for the most part. So the, the cooks themselves have very limited space, have very limited uh, equipment. So with that, it's, it's very basic. Um, the tartar sauce, mayonnaise, pickles, pickle brine, uh, a little bit of minced up garlic and dill. And the aioli itself is a little bit of mayonnaise, sriracha, uh, rice and vinegar, and lime juice. So we can get all those into the stand. They have low, uh, low amounts of real estate, I guess is the best way to say it, within that stand. And then the, the cook can mix them up and then serve them on the side. So Chef, do you have recipes for those or you just kind of wing it? See how it goes. Um, I can get you recipes or I can put rest, uh, some more recipes. I think the... The tartar sauce, I didn't put a recipe for. I think the spicy aioli is on the shrimp uh, recipe, if I remember correctly. I think also you can really add cilantro to it, too, in the uh, stadium. Excellent. Yeah. 
And Chef, we did have one question. What, what is, uh, what's your best, your, your favorite oil for frying? Do you have a, a preference oil. on on type or brand of oil? Uh, I I would say a type or a brand, uh, but go with a very neutral oil. So canola oil for me, it's very affordable. Uh, no particular flavor gets added to it. Um, it's a good clean oil. It's generally low impact on the environment. Um, and yeah, it, it's very versatile too. So uh, it's the canola oil, salad oil, chef blend. Uh, but I definitely, I recommend staying away from olive oil. You don't want to fry in that. Um, it's really expensive and it can add on some funky flavors. Uh, grapeseed oil would be another one, but that is really pricey. Uh, it holds up well, has a high uh, burn temperature for the most part. So our high smoking point, uh, canola, it's, uh, it's up there as far as you don't have to worry necessarily about it catching fire. Um, I know a lot of people like peanut oil around here, but then you always have all the allergens and stuff like that too. Um, but yeah, just the, the quick answer to your question would be canola oil. Thank you, Chef. I've got another question that came in from one of our listeners. Uh, as, as you're going through uh, these items, are, are these the best sellers at the ballpark or what, what are some of the other best sellers that usually sell best at, at Mariners games throughout the year? Oh, best sellers. Uh, that's a really good question. Honestly, our best sellers at the ballpark, uh, garlic fries, chicken tenders, um, are, are by far the number two. As far as seafood goes, we sell a ton of crab, crab sandwiches or judges crab sandwich, uh, which we can get you the recipe for, recipe for as well. Uh, it's very simple. Uh, again, it's a, you grab a Dungeness crab. Generally, you want to kind of pick through it. We use Alaskan Dungeness crab. Uh, again, we pick through it, make sure there's no shell. Uh, we have a butter spread that we put on top of the bread. Pretty much think about like making a grilled cheese sandwich. The, the crab doesn't get cooked all the way through, uh, but there's a little bit of a mayonnaise mixture, a spicy mayonnaise mixture mixed in with the crab. There's a little bit of tomato on it. Then we slather with butter, do a quick toast on it, and serve it to you lightly warm. Uh, so that's by far another one of the top sellers. I would say we easily do like two to 300 a game. Um, sounds like Sounds like a home run to me. Now, Chef, go. as you're putting the final touches on, on those dishes, we've got a question for Becca and George, actually. Um, what are some of the best places that people can buy fish in, in the Seattle area or the Pacific Northwest? Are, are there certain spots that you can plug for our listeners here if people want to go out and buy directly from some suppliers right now? Yeah, definitely. I can share a few. Um, so your local fish market or grocery store can be a great option. Um, I live up in Bellingham, so I will admit I'm not as familiar with every, with everything down in Seattle. Um, definitely the, um, you know, I know Pikes is still open and, and has some good choices. And I'll, I think a lot of the the groceries around here really have amazing seafood counters. Um, and so if you, you know, you can always go there and ask for local. Um, and that not only will give you whatever they have local, but also lets the people buying the seafood know that there are customers interested in buying that and helps um, support that. There's also um, a, a number of places that deliver, um, which is a great option right now when we're all staying at home and staying healthy. Um, a few of my favorites are the Salmon Sisters who are based in Homer, Alaska. Um, and you can order through their website the Alaska's own community supported fishery. Um, also, you can pick up in Seattle or they'll deliver throughout the US. Um, Sitka Salmon Shares is another great one that's a um, fisherman owned um, community supported fishery. And these are where you can basically subscribe and get a box of fish that gives on a regular basis um, that gives you a bunch of different options to try off and they include recipes as well. Um, and then uh, Best Catch Seattle is a community sport of fishery based in Seattle. Um, Lummi Island Wild here in Bellingham, Washington, um, has delivery throughout the U.S. Taylor Shellfish Farms, um, which has locations throughout the Pacific Northwest. And they have a, a store uh, just south of my house here. We love going there when, when things are open. Um, and I know they have a store in Seattle as well um, and deliver throughout the U.S. 
uh, and then Drifter's Fish in Anacortes, Washington. Um, those are some good options. I know that we'll, we'll share those um, on the website. There's also, um, there are in Washington state, tribal fisheries are a really important part of our fishing culture. Um, and a number of the tribes have um, seafood shops online that you can order from as well. Um, so we'll be sure to share those links too. George, did you have something to add to that? Yeah, I know you've right. got some good secrets. Too. <laughs> Just a couple of other resources uh, for folks that are maybe outside the region. Um, there's a fabulous website. Uh, we'll, we'll send it around. It's part of the Marine Fish Conservation Network, MFNCN, and they are a group of conservation organizations and, and fishermen that work together to improve the sustainability of, of U.S. fisheries. Ocean Conservancy is a member of them, um, and they've got a whole list. Uh, no matter what uh, what state you live in, where you can uh, get direct access to seafood right now. So it's a great a kind of one-stop shop, uh, depending on wherever you are in the U.S. to get to, to focus yourself on some local fisheries. Um, the other great resource, a general resource, is uh, from the Seafood Watch Program with the Monterey Bay Aquarium. Uh, they're down the bay from he, me here in, in Monterey, close partner of ours as well, and they put out those little seafood wallet cards that many, uh, many of your uh, listeners may be familiar with. And they'll give you a good sense of uh, what's sustainable uh, and what to support. So those are great resources, too. Yeah, and I, I can't uh, underestimate the the power of a Google search these days, too. I think fishermen are adapting by the day. So those are definitely some sites we know of um, that you can, can easily find, you know, just looking or searching around in your area for uh, fishermen selling seafood. I know here in Bellingham, certain times of the year, there's even, you know, just a sign on the side of the road. So um, yeah. keeping your eyes open for that, always a good, good way to get some good fresh seafood. And just to emphasize that, right, I mean, so re many of the recreational fisheries are closed, so people can't get out. Uh, the commercial fisheries um, are, have been de deemed in most cases to be essential services. And so uh, it's not a matter of not being able to fish. It's, it's a matter of having people to buy the fish. And because most of the fish is going to the restaurants that are shut down, um, there's, there's essentially an oversupply. Um, so anything that we can do to uh, to help uh, fishermen sell their product is going to be critical in the next couple of months. Um, and you know, I think many of us who are sitting at home, quarantined, kind of wondering how we can contribute to this problem, that is a very tangible thing that you can do with your dollar, um, which is going to help uh, you know help our our local fishermen at this time. Um, so it's a really it's a really critical piece. It's not a long term solution, right? There's not going to be enough money flowing um, from us individually. Um, you know, but but it can be a bridge until we can get to the other side of the virus and, and really fire up uh, all the restaurants and all the bars and all the other places that we all like to go to. And George, and on that note, another question that uh, came in, uh, is there a supplier that can be verified as environmental, especially environmentally conscious in the Midwest, perhaps like a national supplier that folks can get if they're not in uh, the Pacific Northwest, perhaps Midwest or East Coast, wh wherever they might be. Is there a national group that you recommend if, if someone wants to buy uh, environmentally friendly seafood? Huh. Yeah, so we'll have to do a little research and try to get some specifics back to you. I would say a couple of things in that regard. So you can now find sustainable seafood pretty much everywhere um, if, if you kind of know what to look for. And, and these seafood guides uh, that the aquarium puts out, they have regional guides. So there is one for the um, the Midwest of the country that has a lot of local seafood on it. The other is that there are a number of other aquariums, like the Shedd Aquarium, for example, uh, and the aquarium uh, in, in Denver um, that, that are partners in this effort. And so you can go to their websites and find their seafood programs and, and track, uh, track things down that way. The other thing that consumers can really look for, and this is especially the case uh, at the retail markets now, uh, is to look for seafood that comes with the MSC label. Uh, or the uh, or the ASC label. This stands for the Marine Stewardship Council or the uh, Aquaculture Stewardship Council. These are uh, bona fide third party certification agencies uh, that um, that basically certify best practices amongst both farmed and wild fish around the world. And you can see that's a little blue tick on the seafood that's sold in the marketplace. Um, and uh, notwithstanding that, one of the, the other things you can do if you're in the market um, is uh, actually just look at the signs on the seafood. You'll be able to detect uh, whether something is U.S. Uh, grown or farmed or imported from other countries um, because of a law called the COOL law, which stands for the Country of Origin Labeling Law, which was passed a number of years ago. 
Um, so there's actually a lot of a lot of information in your local seafood counter. Uh, and um, you know, if you're at the if you're at the market and you can't find any toilet paper, you can spend your time at the seafood counter uh, trying to determine what to bring home for your family. That's great. And so as we wrap up, uh, George, Beck, do you have a few closing remarks, I guess? And Chef, obviously, as you finish up your dish here, I don't know if you want to, if, uh, you want to give folks an update on where the plates stand. Uh, we'll, uh, I guess, move into the uh, grand finale of, of the dishes uh, as long as you're ready. And then as you do that, if Beck and George, if, if you want to speak through any more insights and words of wisdom you have for our, our loyal listeners here today. Uh, Becca, you want to go first, or should I take it? Um, go for it, George. <laughs> well, I, I just want to thank everybody for turning out today. This has been this has been a fun exercise. It's all it's all new to all of us, right? Zoom and uh, and trying to live our lives remotely. Uh, you know, the ocean is a critical part to all of our our wellness, um, and and the kinds of things that Center Plate and the Mariners are doing. Uh, to you know, to bring healthy seafood to people and to um, you know, kind of highlight the role of, of oceans in all of our lives is really critical. You know, I, I think if I if I think back about what this recent coronavirus uh, experience has done, I think it has, for me personally, has conveyed that we really do only live on one planet. Um, we are all part of a global citizenry, and we are all deeply connected to each other. And so, you know, I'm I'm really optimistic that the kinds of partnerships. Um, that we can develop with new new folks like uh, Major League Baseball, other sporting organizations, other folks around the country are are sort of a critical uh, kind of manifestation of, of of coming together to get through this to get through this problem. So um, thank you guys for for participating and for all you're doing uh, on behalf of of the planet, really on Earth Day. Thanks, George. Likewise. Uh, well, I've yeah. I've, uh, I've worked with George long enough. I should have known better than to try to go after him. Those were some pretty inspiring words. Thanks, George. <laughs> um, and definitely agree with all of those sentiments. I think for me too, um, this, this whole experiment, experience of the global pandemic, I think normally this is a, a time of year when I'm traveling and uh, spending a lot of time in Alaska with fishermen in communities. Um, and we're all in our separate places. And I think it too just highlights how connected we are um, and and how much you know just the power of of going out and buying seafood um, can help others out um, and it's such a such a win win for us we get to support our local fishermen um, the U.S. based fishermen and eat delicious seafood so uh, chef I want to really thank you for sharing your recipes I know I learned a lot I and my frying techniques are going to be much improved next time I give that a shot so thanks for that um, and yeah thanks for for sharing with us today everyone yeah i know what i'm having for dinner tonight <laughs> yep <laughs> well i'm glad so you guys chef, do you want to yeah, do you want to show off your final creations there if you want to tilt your main screen down there a little bit just so we can see them all in yeah glory there we go so yeah. trying to figure out which one was which there and so i have the camera close up on it make sure i'm not putting my finger in there uh, so you have your fish and chips, I just cut into it so you can kind of see how it's holding together. Again, I'll be the one eating it, so I'm using no gloves on this. Um, so it's not being served to general public. Um, yeah, it's flaky, it's not dry, uh, nice and moist again. And, then, and the shrimp is the same. It's not rubbery, it's firm, there's a softness to it. Uh, the batter's not coming off on your hands or anything like that. You obviously will get a little bit of grease on your fingers if you try. And Chef, one one final question quick that, that came in from one of our listeners. Uh, when frying the potatoes, can you use the same oil that you put the fish in, or would you recommend uh, splitting it up and going separate? Definitely. You can easily use the same oil. Uh, actually, I would recommend it, too, to be honest. Um, I would just say once your oil – so this is just from one fry. Uh, you can still see the strainer when it goes toward the bottom. Once you get to that point where it's about two, three inches in, if you don't see it, that's a good time to change your oil and then just you start eating fresh. This should be good for another like five, six go arounds or something like that. Maybe even longer, depending on what you fry. Uh, if you're frying stuff that does have a lot of batter or flour, that would quickly degrade your oil. Um, and yeah, so just kind of stick with uh, 
visual acuity for the most part. Kind of look at your product. If it's looking dark, if it's smelling, sorry, I just realized the other, uh, there you go. Uh, <laughs> if it's smelling bad, if it's smelling funky, uh, if it looks too dark and you can't see anything in it, um, and then especially if you like run your like a tong or a spoon at the bottom of it, and you have a bunch of uh, brownish sludge, that's all the flour that fell to the bottom of it. It's gonna start getting your oil a little, or rancid a little bit faster. So you can either continuously strain it out if you want to, or again, recycle it. Uh, we have people here that will recycle our oil, so I can easily pour this into a gallon and then someone can come pick it up for me and then it's off my hands and uh, it helps the environment out. Awesome. And so, and just to confirm one last time, just for everyone at home, you are able to, to bake this as well if, if you don't want to fry, correct? Uh, I wouldn't use the beer batter on it, but you could bake it, yes. Uh, as far as I would just do a, a light coating in the flour, because um, if you did the beer batter, the beer batter would run off. But you could do the light flouring of it and then bake it probably about 400 degree, uh, which will create this nice kind of crust sear on it. Uh, and then the part that's actually touching the baking dish, that will kind of brown up. So that will be the side that you actually want to serve up because it will have a nice brown sear on it. Perfect. And so as we wrap up, do you have any other final words, Chef, on, on your end uh, for, for everyone? Otherwise, I'll, I'll kind of bring us home and, and close this session out for us. No, I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm just glad to be here and happy to have you guys on with me and be able to do this. This is excellent. Again, happy Earth Day and I uh, hope everybody out there is staying safe and sound and staying home and everybody's well. Perfect. Well, Chef mentioned sure. and George hey, and Becca. Uh, yeah, well, George, oh, you've got another comment. Go so, for it. Uh, so uh, for, for any of your listeners who are interested in ocean issues generally, um, we would encourage them to come to our website, which, as you might imagine, is oceanconservancy.org. We spent a lot of time today talking about seafood, uh, but we uh, work on a range of, of conservation issues, including uh, climate change, plastic pollution, which we didn't discuss today, which is a big issue. There's a lot of work being done by, uh, by sports teams around that issue, including the Mariners. So thank you for that. So Feel free to come to oceanconservancy.org. We've got great resources with uh, 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 for, for you there. That's great. And to echo George's note, thank you to Ocean Conservancy for joining us on behalf of Centerplate. Uh, Ocean Conservancy, you guys do, are doing great work. Uh, again, they're one of the leading nonprofit environmental adv advocacy groups in the country. Uh, Centerplate got to know Ocean Conservancy and joined hashtag Team Ocean during Super Bowl 54 in Miami this yeah. past February. Um, together, we were able to, help, we were able to uh, work on the most sustainable, the most green Super Bowl that we've had in, in the history of football. And so being able to bring our, our efforts, to bring our, our uh, relationship to, to the baseball world uh, and to Seattle in particular has been great today. Uh, and, and obviously, Chef Taylor, normally during the season, would be cooking for 50,000 people at a time for 81 home games a year. But instead, today, we had a nice, intimate uh, video cooking session for about 100 of us for uh, one special Earth Day uh, this season. So for that, uh, this was uh, a fantastic way to spend Earth Day all together. And we just want to remind everyone that there's always a way to go above and beyond to support a healthy ocean, a healthy climate, a healthy planet. And center plate, the Seattle Mariners, uh, Major League Baseball, Ocean Conservancy, we will, uh, we will all do our part at all times to support those efforts. And we hope that together the next time you're out at the ballpark, whether it's at T-Mobile Park or any other of our venues throughout the country, uh, we hope that you will uh, come join us and enjoy uh, some, some food and drink with us. So uh, with that, I just want to thank Chef Taylor. I want to thank George and Becca and Michael Farnham with Ocean Conservancy, who is behind the scenes with me, uh, help bring this all together. So thank you to all of you and thank you to our audience. We hope you all continue to stay safe during this pandemic stay well, and we are going to have these recipes and all relevant information posted on oceanconservancy.org afterwards. Follow along at Centerplate, uh, the Mariners, Ocean Conservancy so social channels, and we will make sure to get you all the relevant information that you could possibly want. Uh, thank you again, and we'll see you all at the ballpark soon. Have a great day. The ballpark. Oh, all right. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. <laughs>